Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Today on show number four, we're going to interview an old friend of mine, Franz Wisner, who has really got some interesting stories about travel. You'll hear it on the show, but it's pretty amazing. And it's really amazing how he's turned sort of a challenging situation, if you will, making lemonade out of lemons, where he was basically stood up at the altar almost and turned that experience into a whole new career for himself. And it's just really a cool story. So I think you'll really like this. Again, it's not as specific where we're talking about how to get free upgrades and travel to the world's most expensive cities at at budget prices like we did on the last show or becoming an expert expat like we did on a show prior to that or looking at property and investment opportunities around the world. And we do all of that different stuff on other shows. But this time, we just thought we'd kind of take a more kickback approach and really just sort of listen to an interesting biography. So we will be back with that in just a moment on the Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com. Or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It is my pleasure today to have a very astute world traveler on with us, and it is Franz Wissner. He has written two fantastic books. Honeymoon with My Brother was his first in 2006, and How the World Makes Love in 2010. Franz, welcome. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Hey, my pleasure. So uh, Good to hear your voice again. Well, likewise. So, Franz, you have really, if we can start with the beginning, which is really your entree into, into writing and doing such a great job at it, Honeymoon with My Brother. Tell us the story real fast. Strange, but true story. A few years ago, my life was set. I uh, had a nice house in Orange County. I was working for the Irvine Company. And most important, had convinced uh, my, the woman of my dreams to marry me. And this, it took me a while, but finally she relented and said yes. And so everything set. And then one day I woke up and everything changed. First off, her brother called me and he said, hey, uh, sorry, but she can't go through with the wedding. And this was just a couple of days before the wedding. And I said, what do you mean she can't go through with it? And he says, well, you know, she's, she's just having second thoughts and she's not going to be at your wedding. <laughs> I thought, oh, my Lord, I had all this. Was, this wedding was in a remote location. I had... Food was on its way, wine was on its way, even guests were on their way from, from Europe. And so my brother had this idea. He said, hey, he says, you should go ahead and have a wedding anyhow. And I said, what do you mean go ahead and have a wedding anyhow? He said, yeah, food's there, wine's there. He said, the guests are going to be there. You should be around friends and family at a time like this. Your friends and family are going to be there. Go. And so I took his advice, and I did. I had a full brideless wedding. I had the golf tournament on the Friday, <laughs> the rehearsal dinner on the Saturday, and even a mock wedding ceremony on the Sunday, all without a bride. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it was a surreal experience, as you can imagine. But it was, all, it, it was also heartening in that, you know, of the 150 people we had invited, 75 showed up. So basically my whole side of the aisle. <laughs> Whoa, so her side didn't come, yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and it just felt good to have them there, and they, you know, boosted my spirits, and it made me realize how few times in life we get everybody that means something to us in, in, in one room, and it was, it was neat to reconnect with those folks. They made me feel better about my life, and until the next week when I came back to my, my work, and uh, my boss calls me in, and he said, hey, we've 
done some reorganizing here at the company. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I actually thought, I thought, oh, no, you know, here I'd just been dumped at the altar. I just got a demotion at my work. And, but bad luck comes in threes, right? So I, come, I was walking back to my office, and there's a woman in there measuring her couch. And I'm measuring my couch, and I, thought, I had this beautiful leather couch, right, office overlooking the Pacific. She says, hey, you know, what are you, I said, what are you doing with the couch? And she says, oh, it's not going to fit in your new office. So I thought, ah, okay, there's my third, right? <laughs> so in the span of the week, I lost a fiancé, a career, and a beautiful leather couch. <laughs> the sofa couldn't have been that bad, though, right, <laughs> losing that? It was a nice couch, i got to be honest. All right. <laughs> Not quite as bad as losing a fiancé or a career, but, you know, just added to this, this confusion and this whole notion that my life was absolutely spinning out of control. And it, it almost felt like I was being pushed out of that life. Because if it had just been one or the other, I, I, I would have married. I, for instance, if my fiancé would have dumped me, I would have married my job even more. If my, my job had cratered, I would have turned my energies into my relationship. And both of them cratering in one week just really had my head spinning. So I, mm-hmm. I was driving home from work, and I had this crazy idea. And I come home, and my brother was staying with me. And I come in the door, and I said, hey, Kurt, how'd you like to go on a honeymoon? And he turns to me and he says, with whom? <laughs> I said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. I got honeymoon suites. I got, ho- you know, hotels. I got. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Honeymoon suites have one bed. <laughs> and usually it's heart-shaped. And, like, I love you, I, uh, but there ain't no way I'm going to spend two weeks in a heart-shaped bed. <laughs> so I said, don't worry, you know, we'll, I'll cancel the honeymoon suites. But, you know, I got these airfares, and, you know, we have the same last name, and let's go. And so we did. He, My brother just gotten a divorce, and, and he was had some frustrations with his job up in Seattle, and so we took off, and, you know, we, we really kind of reconnected as brothers and, and had a bunch of conversations that we should have had a long time ago. We were like a lot of brothers and sisters, and, they, you know, you grow up and you just drift apart. You don't spend as much time as you did when you were kids. And, you know, it felt good to, to travel with Kurt and to clear my head, and to, I, I always love travel for that. I think it's very, very therapeutic and inspiring and so at the end of the two weeks we i decided to uh to tell kurt that uh, hey kurt we're going to extend this honeymoon for two years in 53 countries wow and we did we quit the jobs sold the homes gave everything away and kept traveling on this honeymoon around the world amazing now wh- how was he able, how was your brother able to do that i mean what was his job well he was working in real estate up in seattle mm-hmm. and he sold his house and so he com- he had a small pot of money uh and i sold mine and we we said all right we're going to travel until this this money wears off until mm-hmm. we go through it and you know we it, it, we quickly calculated hey if we stick to western europe that would be two months you know but if we <laughs> stick to third world countries yeah, it could be that we can stretch the dollar a bit more and plus that was a lot more interesting to us so we, sure. we took off and we spent a lot of time in eastern europe and southeast asia south america and finally ending up in in Africa. So I want to hear more about the travels, and uh, especially as it relates to your new book, but how did you really get started writing? When did the writing evolve from from the travel? I mean, a lot of people keep travel diaries, they blog about their trips and so forth. What was your evolution into the writing side? You know, I've always been a writer, and I've always been a storyteller. And I've my career started in, in government, and I was, eventually became a press secretary for, for Pete Wilson, both when he was in the Senate and when he was a governor. So I wrote a lot of speeches for him, a lot of press releases. Then I worked in, in public relations uh, for a firm called Edelman Public Relations, which is a big PR firm based here in New York and Chicago with a lot of offices in California. You know, So I wrote a lot of speeches and press releases and documents for, for companies and clients. And so I, I, But I'd never written for me and this so this was a new experience to, go, to be out on the road and to have some free time to be able to, to write for yourself and it was it was very enjoyable and I, I felt like I tapped into something that was there all along and, and I was definitely refining my skills all along I knew how to string together a, a couple sentences the difficult part wasn't so much the, the writing it was um, going internal and and you know, we, so many of us have a great story in, inside of us, it, but it's that, that process of pulling that story out. And that, that was much more difficult than the writing portion, because I was so used to writing about others. I, I think the way that this is particularly interesting to the listeners is that a lot of people, Franz, 
they really have an interest in, they love to travel the world and get paid to write about their travels. Right, right. And I always thought the perfect dream job would sort of be to be a travel writer or a travel right. reporter or correspondent or something like that. And you've done that. I mean, your books have sold just incredibly well. You've been on Oprah, you've been on the Today Show, et cetera, et cetera, just numerous media appearances. What was really your first break in the writing side? I mean, were you on the honeymoon with your brother <laughs> at that point? You know, it wasn't until the very end of the honeymoon when I was debating what to do when I came back, and I didn't want to go back to my old job, and I didn't want to go back to my old life. I wanted a new life, and I wanted to, to keep traveling, and I wanted to, to keep him embracing, and, and I'd love to, to keep doing something with Kurt at the time. Um, and so the, the idea for this book hit me when, after all the money had, had run out, <laughs> and I was thinking about um, what to do next. And so I, I cobbled together a, a book proposal and got an agent and sent it off and promptly got rejected by absolutely every big publisher in New York. You know, they all, they all said no right off the bat. And any writers out there know exactly what I'm talking about. How many rejections did you have? Did you oh, keep track? A couple dozen, I'd say. You know, Mark Victor Hansen, co-creator of Chicken Soup, that hugely right. successful series, he loves to brag about all his rejection letters. There were, I think he had 39 rejection letters. <laughs> That's great. You should keep them. If you're a writer, you should keep every one of your rejection letters because they're so subjective, and beyond that, they're just most of the time they're just inane. I mean, I, I, I kept a lot of mine. mine I, I heard things like, interesting story, not the guys to write it. And I'm thinking, who else was on the honeymoon? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> or another one told me, you know, this, I, I like the premise, but the niche is too crowded. And I thought, A, what niche is well, crowded? What niche, yeah. Crowded. And, and, and B, what niche is my book? You know, That's and, what I'm thinking. What they, niche, travel? To this day, they still have a hard time, you know, putting my books in, the, in a certain category. In some bookstores, they're in travel. Some bookstores, they're in memoir. In Borders, I'm in self-help. So, <laughs> there you can believe it. A guy who's yeah. claimed to fame is he got dumped at the altars and self help. Well, there you go. Either I'll take way. it though. You'll I'll take, take it. it. Sure, sure. So tell us about your big break though. I mean, what happened? Well, finally, uh, a woman at St. Martin's Press and an editor there named Diane Reverend purchased a book, and she didn't spend a lot of money on it, but she said, "All right, I'll." I'll buy this book. But we were thrilled. It didn't matter. It could have been for no money. And we rushed to New York and to tell her thank you and to have lunch with her. You know, we're asking her all these questions about trying to pretend like I'm a famous author and we know what we're doing. This is my brother and I. And then finally, midway through, I, I broke down and I just said, Diane, i got to ask you, you know, why why did you buy the book? Everybody else rejected us. And she said, you know, the truth is, the reason that she bought the book was she had a son who was a senior in high school and had just been dumped, right? First love of this kid's life, and he's dumped. And she said all of these emotions came pouring out of this kid, you know, emotions she never knew existed in this kid. And she said she, she, said she wanted to hug him and she wanted to, to learn more about this, this kid. And she said, your proposal hit my desk that day, at which point, you know, my brother says, God bless your son. And I said, no, 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 God bless the woman who dumped your son. Because uh -huh. if it wasn't for her, I'd, she wouldn't have bought the book. So sometimes you just need a little luck, too. Sure, sure. Well, so what happened after that? I mean, you sold the book proposal, and you got an advance, right? I, I got a very small advance. I had skimped and, and uh, saved pennies. and My, my brother and I rented a, a cheap uh, house in Los Angeles and, you know, did, did some odd jobs, and but spent a year writing the book. And turned it in, and a, a little bit of buzz started to occur after I, I turned the book, and it sold. Sold as a movie to Sony Pictures. Then uh, Vanity Fair said they wanted to make it their buzz book of the month, and then the Today Show said that they'd have a song. All these things kind of happened really quick. And then then Oprah said, "Oh yeah, yeah, no, I want you to come and come and sit on the couch." Uh -huh. <laughs> so we, we did that. We made the pilgrimage to Chicago. And Oprah is the holy grail for the Omni. Yeah. Hey, a movie has not yet been made, though, right? No, no, no. They, uh, and, and I have absolutely no idea where that is. You know, they, uh, you know, they, they That's just up to them, and, yeah. And it's, they, these things tend to take forever. Who knows? Unless Steven Spielberg's listening, and 
you should call in definitely. <laughs> there you go. It's just such a fascinating story, and it's it's really the story of turning adversity into something good, something really positive. What is your biggest challenge being on the road? Being on the road is tough. People love the result of travel; they like to be at the destination, but they don't like the journey in terms of being hustled around in airplanes and planes, trains, and automobiles so much. What's the hardest part? You know, it is it is a, a change of mindset. If you do it enough times, then you start to, to see that as, as part of the process. And, and for a lot of people, their lives are so hectic and, and crazy that the, the thought of, uh, you know, spending 10 hours on a, on a plane with nobody to, to bug them and they can read that book that they've always wanted to read, watch movies to their heart's content, that sounds like heaven to a lot of people. And so it's, 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 it's changing that, that mindset and em- embracing all ports, portions of the journey, not just arriving and getting there. I used to be like that. I used to hate I used to hate airplanes. Now I love airplanes. Right, right. You finally did have a wedding with a bride. Mm -hmm. I know. One showed up. (laughs) Yeah, one showed up. That was great. (laughs) (laughs) You you like that one, too. Uh, Do you you ever get to get on the road anymore? You got a couple kids at home? I I do. In fact, I'm taking them on a big road trip this summer. We're going to drive across the country. But I I, I haven't done as much international travel with them. My they're they're a little young, but but someday. I and I definitely plan on on writing about them as well. I actually I sold a book that was has to do with kids and travel, and decided to postpone it a little bit until uh, my youngest is a couple years older. What is the biggest challenge in terms of research and? At the actual writing process. A lot of people listening would probably like to combine the freedom of travel and writing, but how do they do that? How do they research? How do they write? You know, there, there's some writers that can just sit down at a computer, you know, with a pen and paper and just spew out beautiful prose that doesn't really need to be edited. and It's just gorgeous. And I I hate those people. <laughs> You're jealous, okay? Because <laughs> I'm definitely not one of them. I'm I'm more the type that you know my stuff is like a big old blob of clay, and you throw it out there, and you you hit it and bang it around for a little bit, and then you bang you come back after lunch and hit it some more, and and then slowly but surely it starts to take shape. And for me, it's just like any anything else. You know, it, you need to do it a lot. And, and if you want to be a good golfer, you need to golf a lot. And if you want to be, you know, a good salesman, you need to, to pitch a lot. And, and if you want to be a good writer, you need to, to see it as a job. And I, I always applaud people who take a leave from their 9-to-5 jobs to, to write a book. Because that, that's exactly the approach. You, you can't really do it if you have, you know, this, a 9-to-5 job and then a lot of family obligations. And something's got to give. You can't squeeze it in between, you know, 10 o'clock and midnight every night and expect to have an amazing book. So, you know, the most important thing is just just carving out the time and and making it a priority. And and I'm amazed that I I teach a class here in New York with Media Bistro. And my my students in this class, every one of them, you know, I, I see these huge strides when they just take the time to do it. And it, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the writers in New York or the, the industry tries to make it out like it's the science. It's not. You know, there's some of the best books that have ever been written have been from people who've never written a book before. You know, I'm thinking books like uh, you know Frank McCourt, you know, who wrote Angela's Ashes or, or Tiz. You know, he's he just oh, I'm a I'm just a school teacher here in New York, and you know, I've got a couple stories to tell about my childhood. Boom, Angela's Ashes, great book. You know, a lot of really really wonderful. Wonderful memoirs have come from people who've just thought, you know what, I got a, I, I've got a really good story inside me, and I just, I need to let it out. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. The price, only $197. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. How about the business side of it? When it comes to the book publishing industry, what do people need to know and what are the the hurdles and challenges there? Well, the the first thing that that most 
self-published writers will tell somebody who's about to be published is you plan on doing everything yourself. And it, whatever that level is that you think you need to do, double it because the publisher will, will continuously disappoint. If you get a, a hundred writers in a room and, and ask them if you want to get them griping, the easiest question to ask them is, <laughs> how's the treatment from the publishers? You know, They'll all say that their publishers don't do enough, that they don't promote their books enough, that they don't have them on the best tables and so forth. So you need to you need to get the mindset that hey I'm this is this is my baby and the only person who's going to stand up for my baby is me and so you do need to fashion your own PR plan and your own you know, marketing plan and and how you're going to get get your book out but I, I think in right along with that is is also to know that that nothing is set in stone and that this is such a rapidly changing industry and that you know the the ideas of selling a book are change every day and more and more stuff being done through social media and, and online and classic techniques like the book tour are rarer and rarer. My publisher is St. Martin's Press and they send very, very few people on book tour. They have a hard time generating the bodies, but they invest more in things like online, social media, things like that. Describe when you're doing the tours uh, in terms of the radio tours, getting up early in the morning on the West Coast to do the East Coast Drive and one after another. That's really an amazing thing that I got to experience when I published my first book back 10 years ago now. It's pretty wild how you do that. Yeah, radio is a great way to, to connect with folks. I mean, it, you can have these extended conversations like the one we're having right now, and it's it, that's much tougher with, with television, where if you're lucky, you know, you'll get a three, four-minute segment on a, on a TV show, but it's, it's hard to cover a lot of ground in that. And radio is how America talks a lot, in a lot of respects. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love doing radio tours. I've, I, we try to do them as much as possible. And you're right, if you're on the West Coast, you've got to get up at 3 and make all those East Coast drive call times. But I also love book tours just in general, and I, I insist on them. And I, you know, with my publisher, for all my books, I say, I, you know, I want to go on a book tour. And it's, it, it, you know, part of it's for selling books, but, but more important is just getting out and reconnecting with people and all these book clubs that have read, read my books and have said nice things or things like, hey, you know, if you're ever in Denver or Flagstaff, Arizona or, you know, Winnetka, Illinois, you know, come on by. We got this book club and we love your books. And, and my brother and I, we did a whole book tour one time just on book club invitations. And anybody who, you know, wrote to us and said, we serve pie every you know third Thursday of the month, and we drink great wine and talk about your books. We said, okay, great. So uh, we did. We loaded up his VW van and we spent three months crisscrossing the country doing events and bars and coffee shops and churches and hair salons and anybody who ever invited us to to come to their book club. We we said yes. And folks who we we couldn't get because the tour was over, the dates didn't work. We do phone calls and anybody who emails me with the book club will always do a uh, a phone in with the book club how, how many people usually at a book club i mean that's pretty scrappy that's very grassroots yo totally grassroots it feels like a like a like campaigning for president in new hampshire right yeah. you know? <laughs> and you know a crowd of 20 is great and i i love it because you know you, you're, you're right to have a conversation with people to connect and you know that is a way that allows me me to, to hear as as opposed to just spouting off stuff you know through my through my books i've met some amazing people on the trips and have <laughs> drank some great wine and eaten some fun food and stayed at a bunch of houses people who I've, I've never met before and just a great way to see the country to meet a to meet a lot of people and to create kind of a, a fan base that, that's fantastic so tell us about your second book how the world makes love what is how that the about? world makes love indeed is uh well after after honeymoon came out and there's a lot of success with it the, the publisher said hey you know we want we want another book off you and i said i'm done honeymooning with my brother uh-huh all right <laughs> yeah we were both on to doing other things in our lives and but they said you know we'll write about whatever you want to write and so the the thing that always interested me the most when i travel were the relationships and, and the, the the personal side of travel and and you know the people i met and the, the same conversations that, that we have here at home, you know, love, relationships, you know, how, how do people meet each other? And so I, I thought, yeah, that would be an interesting topic for a book. You know, a look, at, a look at how people around the globe meet each other and date and get married and get divorced and cheat on each other or stay happily married for the rest of their lives. The, the whole, you know, panoply of, 
of relationships. And so I, I spent another, I sold that book and then spent a year traveling the world to countries like Brazil, Botswana, Egypt, India, Czech Republic, Nicaragua, New Zealand, and just talking to people about love. Young, old, gay, straight, rich, poor, you name it. Just tell me about love and, and learned a lot. Learned a lot. I learned that I was kind of like the, the George Costanza of love. That <laughs> every, everything I thought about it was the opposite was true. So if I would have just, you know, done the opposite of everything I thought, I would have been much, much better served. But along the way, along the way after I sold this book and started researching it, I met a woman in, in Los Angeles, mutual friend fixed us up, and fell in love at the, probably the worst timing possible you know it was great for my social life but it it completely messed up my book you know because i was going to write a third person look at love and now all of a sudden i'm in love and so <laughs> all of a sudden it becomes a first person sure. look at love which would actually turned out much much better both the book and and my love life i won't spoil things too much for the for the readers well tell us some revelations about how different cultures deal with the subject of love it's something every human being is interested in what are some of the revelations that came out of and, that? and it's something that the, the entire world shares and it's it's this it's probably the 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 biggest thing that we all agree on we, we can't agree on you know our, our gods or which side of the roads to to drive on or the you know electric currents or anything you know football or football but we do we agree on love and and that's huge, you know. And that's a that's an amazing amazing force out there that you know we we need to to tap into and remind ourselves as as a world community that hey, you know, we we all want the same thing basically. We all we all want to love and to be loved and to create a loving environment for ourselves and and our families. But the approach is is very different in a lot of the countries. And you know, take India for example. I remember when I went to India, I met a woman an older woman, and, and this is the first couple of days I was there, and I was out there for about seven, eight weeks, and she says to me, she said, you know, over the coming weeks, when you talk to people, ask them, ask married couples if they loved each other on their wedding day. And I thought, wow, that's a, that, that's a, that's a silly question, you know, of course you love each other on your wedding day, you know, why would you get married? And I did, and, and to a person, they, they looked at me, dumped on it, and they said, no. They said, how could you love each other on your wedding day? You know, you're, Love is only something that is that comes with time and and work and and dedication and commitment. They said, you know, that in America you kind of set yourself up for a fall. You know, you see you see your wedding day as an apex, as a high, and then when things start to go wrong, there's problems and things always go wrong. Conversely, if if you you know saw your wedding day as a starting point, it's a much healthier approach to love, a much a much healthier outlook, and and. The one lady summed it up beautifully for me. She said, do me a favor. She says, when you get married, don't see your wedding day as a finished mansion. See it as a vacant lot. Oh. That, way you, that way you'll pick up a shovel and get to work. That's a, that's a great, great piece of advice. Very, very good. I thought so, too. I did. And I, that, that re- in every country, there would be like this aha moment like that. Little things that kind of clicked in that I thought, wow, you know, I, I need to incorporate that. And I, I, I did. I, I changed my mind about a, a lot of aspects of, of love and relationships and, and what's important in a relationship and what isn't. Any other revelations you want to share without spoiling it? <laughs> well, one, one big one, um, personal one that I, I got both at home and abroad was the woman I, I started dating was a single mom with a little four-year-old boy. And I'd, I'd never dated a mom, let alone married a mom. And I, I just, I never saw it... Parenting. I never thought about parenting as, in, as important when I was, you know, con- contemplating relationships. You know, I'd, I'd never look at somebody in a bar and think like, "Wow, she's going to be a great mom." You know? Yeah. <laughs> Whereas it's it, it, it's crazy that we don't. You know, it's 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 insane that we don't talk to our partners about that because it's the most important thing if you're raising a family. Sure right? it is. Yeah. You know, you go to countries like in in America. You know, people tend to say you, you ask the question, you know, what what's your dream relationship who's your ideal partner and they'll say things like oh you know somebody stunning and and funny and rich whatever depreciating assets you go to africa and you you go to the villages and who's your ideal partner rarely will they talk about looks they'll talk about things like parenting they'll say i want somebody who's going to be a a good provider for my family i want somebody who's going to be a strong partner you know somebody who's going to be a good good father good mom and that really registered with me, and, and at this, it was kind of a double whammy because at the same time I was hearing this from the world, I was also watching Tracy 
parent and parent really well, and there was something very attractive about that and, and very sexy. And, and I, I just thought, man, she is such an incredible mom. I want her to raise my kids, too. Both Tracy and the planet changed my mind about single moms and great parents and the importance of, of, of being a good parent. Fantastic. That's interesting insights there. Both How the World Makes Love and, and Honeymoon with My Brother, they're both available on Kindle and they're both available you know, to download through the iPhones and such. And There's also websites to honeymoonwithmybrother.com and howtheworldmakeslove.com and people can get a hold of me through both of those websites. Those are great and you, I love the way you segment them up by different the different countries and so forth and mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of photographs on there and, and good stuff. Well, Franz, thank you so much for joining us today. Congratulations on your success. You have made lemonade out of what most people would consider a lemon situation. Right, right. Somebody told me the other day, they said, hey, I've heard of lemons to lemonade, but you've made margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on that, and thank you again for joining us today. Really appreciate your story. My pleasure. Afraid you could lose your home? It's a real fear for millions of Americans. But there is hope with our Do It Yourself Loan Modification Report. Loan modifications are sponsored by the federal government and can be anything from a reduction of the principal balance to a lowering of the interest rate or an extension of the length of your mortgage. Unfortunately, negotiating a loan modification isn't easy. You'll find step-by-step expert advice in the Do-It-Yourself Loan Modification Report from JasonHartman.com. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. Opinions of guests are their own. Jason Hartman is acting as president of Platinum Properties Investor Network exclusively. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.